A very warm welcome to everyone for this next session on multilateralism. My name is Bernard Hoekman. I'm a faculty member here at the EUI, where I direct a program of research on trade and international development. Trade has figured quite prominently in the conference so far. We've had sessions on the Green Deal and where trade fits into that picture, the future of global value chains, the role of trade in uh, addressing the COVID-19 pandemic, which of course has been a, an urgent matter of discussion. And we've had discussions on managing international spillovers associated with subsidies uh, in terms of dealing with the tensions between the United States, China, and the European Union. Uh, all of this is the subject of a lot of research here at the European University Institute. Uh, if you look at the link on the program, you'll find a lot of papers on these types of matters, and also there's a lot of research on our website. To discuss these matters, uh, I'm going to turn to Sasha Vakulina, who is going to have a discussion with the WTO Director General. Thank you. What is the new multilateralism and what happened to the global order during the COVID-19 crisis? How this unprecedented healthcare disaster has changed all the sectors way beyond public health. To get the answers to these questions, to discuss some of the most burning issues on the global agenda, I'm very happy to be joined by the World Trade Organization Director General Ngozi Okonyo Iweala. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Sasha. Let me start with some of the latest developments, what we've heard here as well at the State of the Union uh, conference. We've heard from Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the European Commission here, who said that the European Union is willing to discuss the proposal earlier backed by the United States to waive intellectual property rights for the COVID-19 vaccines. But at the same time, there are some countries that express their concerns, maybe not willing to do that now. What's your take on these developments and what do you think about how it could possibly add just extra time to even more negotiations when time is really of essence? Well, thank you very much, Sasha. Um, what is happening right now is that uh, members of the WTO, as you have rightly noted, uh, they are proponents of the intellectual property waiver. Over 100 developing countries have joined South Africa and India. Uh, in, in asking for the waiver because they believe it's material uh, to access for developing countries to solve the vaccine inequity issue. Um, but there are also proponents, as you've said, on the other side who believe that uh, the, the IP waiver may not be the critical uh, issue for increasing volumes. So my job is to make sure that I bring members together to actually sit down and negotiate <coughs> text that would lead to a pragmatic solution that assures access to developing countries to deal with the vaccine inequity, whilst at the same time making sure we don't disincentivize research and innovation. So that's where we are. The recent pronouncements by the US and so on, I, I'm sure will give an impetus uh, to the negotiations with people and members being willing to come around the table to negotiate text. That's the only way we'll make progress. But I would also like to add this. There are several factors needed to solve the uh, problem of uh, access inequity for vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics. And WTO uh, can play a role in all of them and is playing a role. One is reducing export restrictions and prohibitions so that supply chains can work easily for both final products as well as raw materials and supplies. We also need trained personnel uh, 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 for manufacturing. Um, then we need to increase manufacturing capacity. 80% of the world's exports of vaccines is concentrated in 10 countries, in North America, South Asia, and Europe. And, and we've seen the problems with that concentration now. So we also need to uh, use either idle capacity in emerging markets and developing countries that is available now and can be turned around in the next six to nine months and put in new capacity. For instance, Africa, a continent of 1.3 billion people, uh, imports 99% of its vaccines. So I think something needs to be done to improve manufacturing on that side. Then you have the problem of IP. With IP must come technology and know-how 
Otherwise, you won't also be able to manufacture the product. So it's a complex problem in three parts, as I've explained it. And I hope that members will come together to pull all those three parts in order to be able to help increase volumes. It has been just over a year since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic and this overall crisis. What are the lessons that you draw on it at the WTO? Well, thank you. Yes, there are many lessons that uh, emanate from the crisis. I think some of the, the, the biggest ones everyone has drawn is just how the interconnectedness of the world, just how unprepared the world was for this crisis, whether it's rich countries or poor one, and the need to make sure that our health systems globally in each country are strengthened uh, to, to, to deal with the next crisis. But I think another lesson is just the role of trade. Um, um, even though uh, trade contracted last year by 5.3% in volume terms, 7% in value terms, trade play, played a very strong role in making sure that uh, access to, to uh, medical supplies and equipment uh, was enhanced. So even though overall trade was contracting, we saw trade in the value, uh, uh, value of uh, medical supplies and equipment increase by 16%. For personal protective equipment, 50%. Um, so that shows you that uh, the multilateral trading system did contribute to helping to solve the problem of moving medical supplies around. So that's one uh, factor that I think it's important and a good lesson for us to know that we need to strengthen and keep going the multilateral trading system. I think another thing we learned that is that supply chains um, uh, have been quite resilient much more than people would think. You know, there's all this talk of reshoring, onshoring uh, because of the problems we saw. But we, we, you have seen that movements of, uh, of agricultural products and food have been pretty resilient and steady. Uh, I already spoke of uh, medical supplies. And, and all in all, we find that supply chains have largely uh, worked. Not perfectly, but they've worked. So that's a, a, another a solid lesson uh, that we've learned. And uh, finally, I would say that the role of trade in making sure that we deal with problems of access to vaccines and vaccine inequity is also very impor important. And that's where supply chains matter a lot and issues of transfer of technology and access to uh, um, in, uh, issues of patents and intellectual property. Let me follow up on this one, because of course, over the past year, we also heard calls for restoring production and greater autonomy and self-sufficiency when it comes to the bigger picture of a global trade. Shall we, and if so, how should we rethink global trade and this new multilateralism? Well, first of all, um, I think that uh, multilateralism has taken a lot of knocks. And of course, we've seen increasing protectionism, which also uh, comes about from some of the uh, deficiencies in globalization. As we know, globalization has lifted uh, uh, hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, but it's also left some people behind. Uh, there are poor people within rich countries who have been left behind, and there are poorer countries who have not benefited uh, uh, from globalization. But that being uh, uh, said, I think that, um, that the new multilateralism, if you want to, to call it that, um, uh, it must uh, be, be um, managed and supported in such a way that it can contribute to tackle uh, mm -hmm. the problems that globalization did not deal with, and even strengthen uh, the solidarity and cooperation that we need to solve problems uh, of the global commons now. But let me say something. People are talking of protectionism, deglobalization, uh, globalization not working. I prefer to think of it as re-globalization, that the way that globalization is working is being reorganized. We've seen the first wave in which countries like China and Eastern Europe were integrated into the system, resulting in, in major gains for the world's economies and for those, uh, those countries. Now we need a second wave in which continents like uh, uh, Africa, countries in Africa, other lower middle income and low income countries in Asia and Latin America 
uh, need to be integrated and will be reintegrated into the global system. I think that will give another second boost to globalization that will help take care of inequalities that occurred from both the uh, technology developments as well as the first wave of globalization. So um, let's think of it as re-globalization, you know, strengthening of, uh, of, of multilateralism. That's what I like to think of as the new multilateralism. And practically speaking, how to do that? Because, you know, what's the difference and what are exactly those actions that are needed to make sure that we are not going towards deglobalization, but, as you said, that we are moving towards re-globalization with a different view, obviously, to tackle those very important issues of inequalities and the situation we've seen getting worse and in some areas and some countries in the world, as you said. Well, first of all, we must make sure that the good things about the multilateral systems uh, trading system are kept in place and strengthen the level playing field, the fairness, the non-discrimination, all the principles, uh, the stability of the system is kept going. That is absolutely necessary. In addition to that, I think we need to see how to bring in, let's say, you know, in most countries in the world, micro, medium and small enterprises are really the engines of economic growth. They create the jobs, they move goods around. And yet you find that in many countries, they do not participate in the, in the multilateral trading system. They're not on national, regional and global supply chains. So I think one key issue we need to think about in the, in the re-globalization is how do we bring uh, small and medium enterprises onto these value chains, into the supply chains that deliver goods all around the world. Another area is women, women and trade. You'll find that in most countries, 50% or more of these small and medium enterprises are owned by women. How do we involve them and bring them in? All these actions, how do we make new rules of trade that will be supportive of these sections of our global economy? I think those are the things we are looking at in WTO to see how the re-globalization can bring in those who have been marginalized in the past. Well, women empowerment and bringing them there obviously is the topic very close to my heart as well. And uh, let me ask you here, what, uh, what's your take on this as a woman at the helm of the World Trade Organization? What's, what, what there is something that surprised you the most or struck you the most about it? Well, something that surprised me about the, the, the WTO um, well, I will say it's, uh, first of all, just how important. I, I'd always known that the WTO rules are really important for the multilateral trading system. But in this time of problems, uh, it's just uh, startling how, how important these multilateral systems, the issue of global solidarity, what knits us together, just how important it is. So it has reaffirmed my belief in the multilateral uh, uh, trading system. But the other thing is, uh, what has surprised me or what we need to do more is upgrading the rules of the WTO to take account of what I just said. How do we bring marginalized people into the global trading system? Uh, so, so that's both a challenge, but also an opportunity. The other thing I'm quite excited about is also the digital digitalization and digital trade e-commerce. Uh, which we are working on at the WTO. How do we use this new wave to strengthen uh, the multilateral trading system and again, help deal with the problem of ma marginalized people? So those are some of the interesting opportunities and challenges. Um, but my, bigger, my, my good, I think, surprise is just how important this system is to uh, the stability of the world trading system. Specifically in those challenging times, of course. Um, on the 26th of April, there was the Trade Day 21, and you had an exchange with the European Union's Valdis Dombrovskis about the WTO reforms. Now, can you give us a sneak peek on that one, and how can the European Union weigh into the process of bringing and discussing and finally reforming the World Trade Organization? Well, of uh, it was a very uh, valuable exchange uh, with uh, with Commissioner Dombrovskis. Uh, it's just one of several uh, that we've had uh, because the the European Union is, of course, uh, so important uh, not only in the multilateral uh, trading system um, as as critical to 
the volume of exports and imports uh, within the world. Um, the second, third largest trading bloc, if you if you want to 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 call it that. Um, so uh, what the European Union does is critically important for the WTO and for the world trading system. And we've exchanged a number of ideas that uh, the EU is coming up with with regard to WTO reform. And, and I find those ideas very helpful, uh, very interesting. Um, uh, you know, there are issues of how do we complete some of the ongoing negotiations that the WTO has been involved in. Uh, for example, fishery subsidies negotiations to support sustainability of our oceans. Uh, um, we've been, this has been going on for 20 years and I know the EU and all the other members are very desirous to complete this multilateral round. So we've been talking about how to do that. We, we've been talking about um, issues of the dispute settlement system of the WTO, which has been paralyzed. And how do we uh, you know, reinvigorate and, and, and reform that? Uh, we've been talking of upgrading, bringing the, the rules of the WTO up to 21st century issues. I just mentioned issues of digital uh, um, uh, trade and e-commerce. How do we do that? And, and the EU is very supportive in those areas. And then we've come to trade and climate. How do we bring WTO rules uh, to help with the greening uh, and the decarbonization of, of, of our economies? Um, and, and, you know, helping us to build back better from this pandemic. So that's another area where we've been having quite a few conversations. And I think that the EU's thoughts and their thrusts on WTO reform are very helpful in this area. And what's, what's your take now when, when you have negotiations with the European Union on that, of course, and the exchange with Valdis Dombrovskis and other representatives of the European Union, but now we also have the United States with the new administration back on the global trade agenda after quite a few challenging years in the United States, and uh, they're clearly now stating with the new administration uh, their devotion to multilateralism and to global trade. Have you had an exchange there as well? And what do you think about what to expect on that side? Well, um, I think there are one or two things. The first thing I would really like is uh, some of the long running disputes between the United States and the EU uh, on, uh, on the Airbus Boeing uh, dispute, some of the others. That's just uh, one of them that has been going on for a long time. It would be really great if we could find a way to settle this uh, on a bilateral basis, because I think that will clear the air and the deck uh, on, on, on uh, those issues of dispute settlement and trade. But with respect to the new administration, I think we have to understand that some of the difficulties that uh, the US has uh, with the multilateral trading system or the WTO uh, have transcended several administrations. They've ha they have some concerns about the uh, dispute settlement system at the WTO. They have concerns about issues of, you know, the level playing field, uh, the issues of subsidies, both uh, uh, within the world and what that creates in terms of an unlevel playing field and a balance of rights and responsibilities within the WTO and the multilateral trading system. So all those issues, I think they've, they've been a factor of different administrations and of course of Congress. I think what we see is a new willingness to really tackle those issues in a more constructive manner. Uh, so when the administration says that, you know, they, they, they're, they're back, to multilateralism, I think we're seeing evidence uh, that this is the case, they are willing to engage. Uh, but the problems uh, are not different. It's just that there's the willingness to try and solve them in a more constructive manner. But we, we, it will take some time um, um, to, to sort all of these things out because, because they've been of long standing. All the WTO members have committed to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and many of those SDGs relate to protection of the environment. In the bigger process of shaping up the new multilateralism and this re-globalization, as you say, how to make sure that trade policy is responsive to climate and environmental challenges? 
Well, I think that trade can really contribute substantially uh, to lowering carbon emissions globally, to the decarbonization of our world, and to greening, uh, uh, greening our world. And um, I, I think there are many opportunities that we can explore. First of all, in 2016, WTO members were negotiating uh, an agreement on environmental goods and services, which would have helped to incentivize a move towards using cleaner and greener technologies and goods. So there is a possible, but those, uh, those negotiations were stalled. So one of the things that we could do and we are trying to do is see how to revive uh, those negotiations and, and see if we can complete them in a way that would be beneficial to, to members and globally to the environment. Of course, there are issues of how to tackle carbon emissions within this, uh, the uh, uh, ambit of trade and uh, various mechanisms, including the carbon border adjustment as a mechanism that the e, uh, EU is looking at are being looked at and debated. We are also studying this issue at the WTO to make sure that whatever happens will be congruent with WTO rules. Um, and, and that's what's going on. But there's, we need to look at various instruments that uh, could be applied uh, to help make trade more responsive to the environment. And I think it's an interesting and challenging area, and we're looking forward to doing more work with the EU and with others on the issue of environment. But now with, the, uh, with where the global trade and global economy is because of the COVID-19 crisis, is that about really using this momentum when it comes to recovering and, as they say in the EU, growing not only bigger but growing better and going greener? Is that this unique momentum to go more environmentally uh, conscious and friendly there? Absolutely. I think it's that uh, we should see it as an opportunity. Um, you know, massive amounts of fiscal stimulus have been administ administered in so many countries around the world. I mean, the, the richer countries have gone up to uh, almost 28% uh, of GDP in fiscal stimulus. Emerging markets, 6.9% of GDP. And low-income countries, 1.9%. There's $26 trillion or more fiscal stimulus. So if we are putting these massive amounts of money, uh, which is needed, by the way, to bring the global economy back and out of recession, uh, but if we are putting that, why don't we use it? Not in the old ways that lead to a generation of uh, more, more carbon emissions, but in new ways that lead us to, to a greener, Path. I think when people are talking about building back better, this is what they mean. And I know that um, we can use these resources so much more productively, make greening the environment and do using it in a sustainable way. By the way, the, the purpose of the WTO is very much embedded in that. How do we support sustainability? How do we create employment for people? How do we improve living standards? And now when the, after this year of massive stimulus when it comes to monetary fiscal stimulus and all the efforts we've seen from central banks, governments, everybody around the world over this year, it's also now a tricky period of readjusting because at some moment this stimulus and this help, of course, will be over. When it comes to the global trade, the position of, of the WTO and your view on how to make sure that it's done in a smoother way so that we are not... Uh, damaging anyhow and not doing any bad to the global trade here? Well, I think we, we what I would say to our members is to, uh, you know, resist using trade or tr trade instruments as a means of solving what are really political problems. Because if that is when we start to damage trade. We must separate what is what are political problems from trade issues and problems. And I think if we do that, we'll have a much better atmosphere in which to, to move the multilateral trading system. I think some of the tensions manifesting at the WTO with respect to uh, some of our membership, be it, be it developing and developed countries or among the richer countries or members themselves, uh, I think will, the temperature will, will lower. And, and that is good for the multilateral trading system. Second, we must continue to ensure that the multilateral trading system and the rules that underpin it result in a fair, open, transparent, and, and you know, predictable and stable multilateral trading system. That is what all our members are looking for. And any things that undermine that, you know, also create problems 
for the stability of, 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 of trade and, and the trading system. So I'm hoping that, um, you know, these very basic principles that were used to establish uh, the trading system and uh, through the WTO rules will continue to maintain them because that's what makes trade uh, work in a, a smooth fashion. Looking at the short-term perspective, uh, from one to three years, let's put it that way, what are some of the probably achievements or goals that you are the most looking forward to? Uh, from in the next one to three years, actually in this first one year, I am looking forward to a number of achievements for the WTO and for trade. I think first and foremost, uh, we've got to change the WTO to, to uh, an organization that achieves results. Um, the, the, the image that the WTO uh, doesn't get results is dysfunctional. That has to change. And I see the great potential for doing changing that, even within this one year. By the time we have our 12th ministerial conference uh, in December, and this can be done through focusing on results. First, we have the great opportunity of completing the fishery subsidies negotiations, which have been going on for 20 years. And I've said, if this is about supporting the sustainability of our oceans and the livelihood of our fisher women and men, we must complete these negotiations. So that's really top priority uh, as far as I'm concerned. It will give us a win. I think the second area that I'd like to see results is on trade and health issues. We have the unique opportunity as the WTO to contribute to the problems we are facing right now with respect to the pandemic. And I've already illustrated that trade, the multilateral trading system has been part of the solution. I would like us to do more when we complete these negotiations on intellectual property and transfer of technology and know-how, we would have had an instrument that can contribute to solving the problems of access to medical supplies, equipment, and vaccines. So that's a big contribution that we could finalize at our ministerial conference. I, I, I think uh, uh, the third area is on agriculture. This is an area of vital imp importance to all our members, both developing and developed. And we have some areas on food security issues. You know that the multilateral trading system has also assured the, the, uh, that food supplies are stable and traded stably around the world. So food security is an important thing. How can we get to some agreements uh, that would be beneficial to members in that area of agriculture? Uh, we, of course, have the issue of subsidies in, in, in both industrial subsidies and domestic, what we call domestic support, which are agricultural subsidies, which lead members to fear that there's uh, no longer a level playing field with regard to competition uh, in trade between countries. So we, we, are, we, we need to look at that. That's an area I would like to make some progress. And then uh, uh, let me just say on the dispute settlement mechanism, vital to rulemaking at the WTO, I'd like to see some, uh, some progress there. So a lot of uh, opportunities in the next one to three years to, to rebrand the organization. Well, as you said, some of those issues have been dragging on and on for years indeed, and we've been watching developments or in some cases, lack of developments there. And I would really want to, uh, to ask you this question on when it comes to the developments and sorting out some of these important issues, as you've just mentioned, something that you're looking forward to for the next one to three years, uh, precisely the issue of doing so, being more socially and people-oriented, tackling, of course, some of these inequality problems, as we discussed a bit earlier. Uh, well, let me start by saying something. If you look at the preamble to the Marrakesh Agreement, which set up the WTO, you will see that the WTO is very much about people. Uh, the preamble says that the WTO should, uh, uh, the purpose is to help improve living standards of people, help create employment, support sustainable development. That was in 1994. It's just as relevant today as it was then. Uh, and so that is uh, what excites me, the fact that, look, trade is a means to an end. The end is to develop and improve people's lives. It's all about people. And, and so the WTO and its instruments should be used to improve the lives of people. 
whether it's poorer people within rich countries, whether it's uh, uh, poorer developing countries, the rules should be such that we can bring them into the world's trading system and use that as a means to improve their lives. And all of these results that I'm talking about should lead to improvements in people's lives, whether it's in agriculture, where you know many people in, in, in developing countries have their livelihood, whether it's in fisheries, we've seen fisheries important to both uh, poor countries and large countries, whether it's in trade and health and helping to solve the pandemic or even in environment, every single area, we have the opportunity to improve people's lives. Thank you so much. And I'm now joined on stage by Martina Ferracane, the European University Institute Fellow, with her question. Thank you and good morning, Director General. Uh, uh, research conducted also here at the UI shows that uh, discriminatory restrictions at the border on cross-border, uh, sorry, <laughs> I shouldn't, uh, that restrictions on cross-border data flows which apply at the border uh, create a greater negative impact on trading services compared to uh, domestic regulation uh, that aims to achieve, for example, data privacy and consumer uh, protection. Um, and the, our research suggests that the WTO should focus on this type of uh, discriminatory restrictions at the border, while domestic uh, regulation uh, can be uh, better placed at achieving policy objectives such as uh, data protection. Um, how do you suggest that we can contribute to increase the understanding of WTO members that uh, restrictions which have been imposed now at the border in a discriminatory way can create problems for those companies that you also mentioned, like small and medium uh, enterprises, which can make the most from digital trade opportunities? And also, I wanted to ask you, how do you think that uh, researchers and practitioners can engage more with WTO negotiators and contribute to uh, also provide the information and transparency on a nuanced and uh, uh, complex topic such as digital trade? Thank you. Well, well thank you very much. And I, I want to commend the important work done by EUI uh, in these particular areas. Let me start by saying that we'll completely welcome uh, interaction between researchers and practitioners and, and what they can find, uh, their research on these issues with us here at the WTO. We actually have a, a division uh, that deals with knowledge and interacts with un universities and academics. And I'd welcome the sharing of uh, your findings with us here and with, with our members. On the very important issue of digital uh, trade, which you've uh, talked about, uh, let me say that this is one exciting area where, as you rightly noted, we can really use to improve uh, uh, the integration of micro, small, and medium enterprises and women in trade into the world trading system. We do have an e-commerce uh, uh, um, set of negotiations under what we call the plurilateral track uh, ongoing here uh, at the WTO. And there are more than uh, 80 uh, of our members who are involved in these uh, uh, negotiations. And indeed, they are looking at what happens and what to do with uh, data loc lo localization requirements, uh, uh, what are the barriers to the free flow of data, how should we handle. Remember that many developing countries don't yet have the regulatory systems to be able to deal with these issues. So that's one area where we are looking at how do we build capacity to enable them to do that. All this whilst looking at privacy and security concerns as you've uh, rightly raised. But I want to say one thing, regulatory issues within uh, countries, of course, the prerogative of the national authorities, but we do require that these be non-discriminatory. This is absolutely essential to WTO rules. And so um, I, I think this is an area where we would be looking to work with our members to indeed make sure that rules are not discriminatory, they conform with WTO requirements. So thank you very much. I'm looking forward to better cooperation with you. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you, you very too. much, thank Martina. You. And thank you very much, uh, Ngozi Okoyewala, the Director General of the World Trade Organization. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha.